The psalmist writes, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Will you join me, please, in prayer as we give ourselves to God in these moments of worship? Our gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you in this morning hour, giving ourselves to you because in Christ you gave yourself for us. It elicits from us a sense of worship, a desire to honor you, to give you the praise that you so wonderfully deserve. And so during this service of worship, would you, by your Spirit, use the words of the songs we sing, even the words of the prayers we pray, and the words of our preacher, Joel Gregory, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to deepen us to faithfulness in Christ, and to honor you. We bow to you, we bow before you. We kneel before you, our maker. We, your sheep, need your care. And so we give ourselves to you in the name of the one who gave himself for us. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Welcome to worship and let's join together giving ourselves to him. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Good morning, Truett. Will you stand as we begin singing this morning? We're going to start with the traditional, I'll fly away and then go into graves, into gardens. The words should be printed in your bulletin. And uh, hopefully we'll get a little energy in the room here. Let's do a little, a little Southern Gospel. Yes, I'm glad morning when this life is over. I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Shadows of this life have grown. I fly away like a bird from prison walls has blown. I fly away. Yes, I fly away. Oh, glory. I fly away in the morning when I die. Just a few more weary days and then I fly away to a land where joy will never end. I I search the world 
Well, I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise The treasures I pay Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together
Our scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a long time in the land he had been promised as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he, re he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. The word of the Lord. When I was a young pastor in my first pastorate in a small spit town in the Appalachian Mountains in western Pennsylvania, I was able to reach out to the known world through a series of high technology in that day, a series of tapes, cassette tapes. These cassette tapes were published through Christianity Today's Preaching Today ministry that has been going on for years and years. And I would put the tape into my cassette tape player and listen to preachers from around the world and around this country. One of those preachers I listened to was Dr. Joel C. Gregory. I'd never heard of Dr. Gregory, but in that small, teeny town, I was able to hear his great big voice. Never dreaming, of course, that the Lord would allow our paths to cross by his providence to come here and teach together at Truett Seminary, Baylor University. I look on that as uh, someone who was um, completely unaware of the goodness and grace of God that would continue to pour and pour on someone like me to be able to, to teach with Dr. Gregory and Dr. Alcantara, and to be able to serve in this particular way at this particular place. And so today, we have a preacher who's known through not only cassettes, <laughs> but uh, through his ministry in churches and in conferences, and here, where he's made his home at Truett Seminary. And it's our delight and privilege to be able to hear from him as he unfolds God's word for us and to us so that we might become the men and women that God has called us to be. So please uh, welcome Dr. Gregory as he comes to the pulpit and pray for him as he comes that he might speak God's word to us. Well, thank you, dear colleague. I'm Scott Gibson. It is an honor to be here today in Druid's Chapel and to share the Word of God with you and those who are listening beyond here. Here I am. Those words were spoken three times by the patriarch Abraham in that famed Genesis 22. 
Would you let me read into your hearing a few words from this text? After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and we will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father? And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. God and Father of Abraham, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that these words, so familiar to so many, might come to life and delight in a new way in these moments together here. In order that we too might say, here I am. In the name of that greater son of Abraham, even our Lord Jesus. Amen. Guidepost Magazine is a hardly a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> but it is a collection of the response of faithful and godly people to what God is doing in their lives. Upon a time, they ask a question, has God ever spoken to you? Well, they got an avalanche of responses. Anne Logan of St. Louis wrote and said when she was in bed suffering pain, God spoke to her from a large crucifix on the wall and said, I am with you. <laughs> Janet Gaddis from Comstock Park, Michigan, didn't believe God spoke to people. She had certain thoughts about people who said they heard God speaking. <laughs> and then she overslept picking her daughter up at school. She wrote guidepost and said, I heard a voice, wake up. And I got my daughter safely. Then in her Lutheran church, she was praying that her mother might be baptized. And she heard the voice again, it's already accomplished. And then when she was in bed in the hospital herself, back in pain, the voice said, Jesus' back hurt worse than this. I don't know what you make of folks writing guideposts. I take somewhat more seriously Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1956 in his kitchen while people outside were terrorizing him and threatening to kill his family. And the American Civil Rights Movement held its breath 
till he said, Jesus said, I am with you. Now, I know. I know when I'm talking about these people from guideposts to, <laughs> who say God spoke to them. Uh, I don't have to be clairvoyant to understand. Some of you think he did and some of you think they have voices in their head. I understand that. When I was in seminary in another city another time, there was a lunch bunch of us who would leave campus and we would go to a fast food franchise on Seminary Drive. It's usually the same bunch, but every now and then one guy would sit in the back seat, a particularly pious student, and he wanted to pray where we would go. And he would announce from the back seat, McDonald's, <laughs> Whataburger. Now, I can confess this years later, I thought the cheese had slid off his cracker. <laughs> I thought he was crazier than the dog in a hubcap factory and a whole lot of Southern sayings. But God does speak, certainly in scripture. He spoke to Moses and he spoke to Abraham right here. Now we'd like to know how he did it. Was it a dream at night? like Abraham's great-grandson, or was it in a day vision, or was it an audible voice, and how did it sound? Was it commanding? Was it soft and plaintive? But God did speak to Abraham. Now, the other day, uh, I gave a report to our faculty from this same passage, but colleagues, I'm going to say something different today. <laughs> There are many angles of vision on this passage. One of them, looking at it straight on, makes Abraham the center of it. Another angle of vision is what I would call anamorphic. Hans Holbein was an anamorphic painter. In 1533, he painted a painting called The Ambassadors. And if you look at it straight on, it looks like two businessmen looking at a map. If you look at it at an oblique angle, you see a skull under the table where they are. Different angle of vision. You can take the angle of vision in this passage looking at Sarah or Isaac or even at those two silent servants seriously seeking to do the will of Father Abraham. But I'd like to take a moment to look at it just one other way. Three times in this passage, Abraham answers, here I am. It's sort of a roll call, one of them leading to the next. You see, God may speak to you, and your response, here I am, will change everything. Here I am may change things in a moment that you don't understand what it means for your future. I have a little sympathy with Abraham. It says in Genesis 22, after these things. This wasn't that he was at ease there in Beersheba in his tent with his household staff of 318, Genesis tells us. <laughs> no, he had just sent Hagar and Ishmael away, and that pulled at his heart. He just settled a disputed water bill with some people over in the next tent and Abraham must have just wanted to rest but at that inconvenient moment God told him the hardest thing he'd ever heard you know I wish God would speak to me in those days like Robert Browning's famous words in Pippa passes God's in his heaven and all's right with the world and here's some good news you know Pippa is passing over in front of Browning Library or, like Julian of Norwich, all things well, all, all manner of things are well, all manner of things will be well. Seems like to me God generally speaks to me when all manner of things may not be well, and he doesn't seem to be in his heaven and all's bright with the world. That's how it was for Abraham. This famous quartet of words. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And <laughs> Why did he have to say it that way? I'd like to know exactly how it sounded. 
But we can't get behind that because the spare prose in this is just absolute perfectly, not more than a word more or less than we need to hear about this episode. Abraham was the first person to hear something like that, and that's why we're talking about him 4,000 years later. <laughs> uh, Abraham, incidentally, to state the obvious, didn't have the story of Abraham. He couldn't turn to Genesis 22 and say, I wonder how this is going to come out. He never heard Hebrews 11 canonizing him as a hero. He never read James 2 talking about his faith. Abraham was the first, for which in a way there was no second, and that's why we're here talking about him. <laughs> you know, Jackson Pollock dripped paint on a canvas on Long Island, but you can't name the second paint dripper. <laughs> Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, but you probably don't remember the next people. We talk about him because he did this without any precedent. Here was this meandering Mesopotamian who heard this voice. <laughs> Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And we're talking about it because he was first. But you know what? Somewhere in your walk of faith, that same voice will ask you to do something for which you have no precedent. Now, that voice had come before. He, he, he left Ur with his father, Terah. I think Terah must have heard that voice. His brother had died. There was a grave in Ur with Haran, his brother, and then they, uh, Iran and Terah died at 205. And that voice came to Abraham again and said, I want you to go without knowing where. I want you to wait on me without knowing when. I want you to believe I will do what I said I would do without knowing how. <laughs> that is, God handed him. And here too in Genesis 22. And said, I want you to sign a blank check. That's also in French called a carte blanche. Like a lot of things, it sounds better in French. Here's a carte blanche, a blank piece of paper, Abe. I want you to sign it and give it back to me. <laughs> a carte blanche was used in history. It's interesting. Charles II was trying to get his throne back in the roundheads. He gave a carte blanche to anybody who would help him. He said, help me fill this in, take it to the bank or the hotel. In a worse way, the French aristocrats would uh, give to their mistresses a carte blanche with their name. They could take it to Neyman's or Nordstrom's or somewhere and cash it in. He gave him a carte blanche. And in verse 1, Abraham didn't know what God would write on that. But he found out in verse 2 that that carte blanche was the hardest thing he'd, <laughs> he'd ever saw. And incidentally, he didn't know about his future fame. He didn't know, if I will sign this carte blanche, they'll write about me in Genesis 22. He didn't know that a million rabbis and preachers would preach about this passage. <laughs> he didn't know in November, Joel would stand here at Truett Seminary and talk about him 4,000 years later. He had no idea what that carte blanche meant. Now, if that troubles you, that's how it is in faith when... When that Nazarene carpenter walked by James and John in Zebedee's boat mending their nets, they didn't read the Nicene or Chalcedonian Creed and say, my, there goes the man who's the hypostatic union of God. No, there was a Nazarene carpenter who walked by and they gave him a carte blanche. John didn't know 1900 years later a million Southern Baptist kids would stand in sword drills and open the Bible to John. Matthew didn't know there'd be a million boys named for him and thousands of churches named St. Matthew. They just got out of, the, out of the boat and gave him the carte blanche. <laughs> I, I never forget that we're sitting here in this building named Truett because a boy who had a law scholarship to Mercer had to leave it and come up north of Dallas and go to work to help his father Save the family farm, but in that carte blanche, the name of this place, K 
came about. Now, that doesn't always lead to glory. It may be like those 20 Coptic young men in February of 2015 on the seacoast of Libya who gave their heads because they would not deny Jesus. Two of them were brothers. They'd grown up together playing soccer, planning to get married. But when they gave him that carte blanche, it has another destiny in it. <laughs> I go back sometime, if I could be self-referential, to the Connell Baptist Church on the west side of Fort Worth when I was 16 years old, a sophomore in high school, wanted to be a biological researcher, and sitting there, I heard a voice, just as real as any I ever heard, preach. I got him, came down the aisle, and gave him that carte blanche. I didn't have a clue that the highest highs and the lowest lows I could imagine would be in handing him that blank check. <laughs> you. This doesn't do much good if we just get together here to have a memorial service about what God did with Abraham. You'll have the opportunity again and maybe again to give him a carte blanche and everything else in your life will unfold from that moment. But let's look at this another way. Here I am may mean you have to answer other people's questions about God that are hard to answer. <laughs> They're walking. It's interesting <clears throat> how in the genius of this narrative, the pace deliberately slows. Abraham was a wealthy man. He didn't have to cut his own wood. He didn't have to carry his own fire. He didn't have to saddle his own donkey. <laughs> he had people who did that. But in this, this, the narrative slows. He cuts the wood. He saddles the donkey. He carries the fire pot. It's as if he's reluctant. Somewhere on the trip, Father, here's the wood, here's the fire. Where's the lamb? Now, can I dare to tell you this? Abraham's answer sounds like it could have come out of a book entitled 100 Sappy Spiritual Clichés. God will provide. Man, man, I just seem to be more honest if you just ghosted him, not said anything. Yet, yet, sometimes that will be the only thing you can say, honestly to people you walk with when they're caught in the contradiction of what they thought God would do and the reality of what he's actually doing. And you'll stand there and say, God will provide. Sergeant Kierkegaard in 1843 wrote uh, a long essay, Fear and Trembling. And in that essay, he talks about Abraham being caught in the absurdity of his own life. On the one hand, this 75-year-old had waited 25 years to have a son, and everything about his future legacy was tied up in that son, where he was going to have a genealogical chart, <laughs> well, with as many entries as there are stars in the sky. Now the contradiction, take a knife, and after you've put him on wood, slit his throat and burn him. <laughs> and he had to walk in the absurdity and that anxiety. And I expect on the way to Moriah, when he put down one foot, Abraham thought promise. And when he put down the other foot, anxiety and problem. <laughs> You're here preparing to be ministers of some kind, whether preaching people or missional people or counseling or some kind of vocation where if you have a degree from this place, people are going to think you can answer hard questions. <laughs> and they will ask you. And sometimes the best you can say is what seems like this banal word from Abraham. <laughs> You'll go somewhere to serve a church. And you've idealized church. 
And then you'll find out to dwell above with the saints in love. That'll be glory to dwell above with some of the saints. I know that's a different story. And you'll be serving people who'd think they would do God a service by running you off. And your wife or children will say to you, why are they treating you that way when you serve them? And you know what? The best thing you can say is, God will provide because there's not another answer. Or you'll stand where I've stood more than once. Hardest thing I remember in my life, standing at the head of a casket with a young mother in it. And three little children on tiptoe, eye level with that casket, trying to look in, saying, Mommy! And their terrified husband looking at me and asking, Why did God do this? And you're not going to have much better word than the word of faith. God will provide and you'll walk on in silence with that family. There's two problems we have when people come with hard questions like Isaac did. One is... We know too little. One of the problems in ministry is a kind of a cynical careerism that can doubt the very message you're supposed to bring. And you just shrug your soldiers and say, I don't have anything to say. No, I hope you can walk with them and say, God will provide. But the other temptation is to have too much to say and to be the answer man or the answer woman. And feel like you've got to explain everything that people ask you when you can't. That'll turn you into Job's so-called friends. Remember them? Eliphaz, Bildad. They thought they had the answer. When all they needed to do was sit there with him and say, God will provide. We only think we know the answer. You know, at the, I don't want to go on an excursus, but at the end of that book, God gave them an answer those three friends would have never thought of. God told Job, I made a crocodile and I made a hippopotamus. You can't do that. I'm God. <laughs> you don't have all the answers. And sometimes all you can say is God will provide. And you'll sit there with that deacon, the godliest man you ever knew, whose wife has dementia and every morning he takes her breakfast and sit there and talk to him even though she doesn't know who he is and goes back in the evening and takes her dinner and sits there and talks with her even though she doesn't know him and all you better say is God will provide and just sit there with him. But here's the good news. I don't sound bad news. The good news is God did. <laughs> Here was this ram with a GPS in its noggin. The God of the cosmic universe, 14 billion light years, astronomers say, at the speed of light to the edge of it. That God, God of heaven and earth, put that ram in that thicket and God did provide. And what it means to be a person of faith is to stand with others and in your own way say God will provide and then silently walk the rest of the way with them in confidence. Let me say another thing. I'll sit down. <laughs> Third time, here I am. That means God may stop you from doing one thing because he has something better. Now I know this story is sui generis. There's nothing else just like it, but that's true. Sometimes God will stop you from doing one thing. Now, this, this, here's Moriah, here's the wood, here's the knife, here's Isaac. And I don't know. He could have been anywhere between 17 and 36 years of age, some of the rabbis said. Quivering knife in the air. And the third time, Abraham, Abraham, stop. The first time, was a bridge to the second and the third time. When he said, here I am to begin with, in that moment were the hard questions. And in that moment was this angelic theophany saying, stop. <laughs> At the last moment, when he was about to step over the ledge, the voice said, back up. At the last moment, when he's about to go over the waterfall, 
A voice said, over here is a calm pool. At the last moment, breathtaking, last heartbeat, the voice said, stop. Now, we don't have time to explore what God knew and what Abraham knew and why God put him through this. That's a whole other message. Now, I should say this. I think God did know what was going to happen. I'm not a member of the Theistic Finitude Society. I think he did know what was going to happen without determining what was going to happen. You may feel differently. But I do think this was for Abraham. Because now, Abraham knew what he could not have done otherwise. Now, if it troubles you that God would tell Abraham this, you're going to have trouble with that greater son of Abraham who said, if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. All of life has a probation about it. It's the nature of it. In fact, the revised version started saying God proved Abraham, but Abraham proved it to himself. <laughs> Here's a piano student. That piano student has a piano teacher, strict, like mine, used to hit my fingers with a little stick. I don't think they can do that anymore. <laughs> no, somebody testified over here. All right. But playing those scales, you play them and play them, mind-numbing, until something happens. You know you can play those, and then if you get very good at it, you can sit down and sight read Chopin or something that Rachmaninoff wrote. It's probation. You know, like piano, here's a father treading water at the deep end of the pool. He tells his little boy, jump in. Doesn't say I'm going to catch you. He says, jump in. But that is a life-determining moment when that little boy jumps in because the father catches him, and he knows he's safe. You don't like music or swimming pools. What about Greek paradigms? There you are with those flashcards, trying to remember all those verbs. Conjugation, Dr. Ray Summers used to say he had a student going through those flashcards. He would say, luo, expletive, luo, expletive. But if you'll do it a second and a third, in a fourth year. After that probation, there'll come a time when you can pick up the very words of the apostles and scan them for yourself. Everywhere in life is a probation. We have a knife up in the air, but thank God he can say, stop. We're all Abraham. We're people with a promise and a problem. <laughs> promise? This church called you to preach. Promise you'd be the pastor or whatever you are. <laughs> and then they decide they don't like you or what you say. But then, somehow in that absurdity, God gives you a clue to the maze. You get married, you're married, and one or both of you decide, I didn't really know who you were. <laughs> but then you get a user ID and a password to a whole new page, and God does some. Or you, you, you came here to true it. You said, I heard a voice. It said, go to true it. But you got here at this rich university in this very poor town with bugs bigger than you ever saw and it's hot till Christmas. <laughs> and here you are, but God shows you a path through the mountains that you didn't even know was there. That's what it means to say, here I am. Once again, not being unduly referential, let, let me tell you a time God caught my hand in the air. I was a PhD student over in Tidwell Bible Building, other side of the campus, and I was pastor over here at the Emmanuel Baptist Church in 18th and Dutton. I was 27 years old, and my life consisted of running from a seminar back to the church and from the church to the seminar. It had all the expected problems of, a, of an old inner city church. And then a pastor search committee showed up from a big church 
that had television in four states. That's way before cable. That was a network affiliate. They came once. They came twice. They came three times. There came a fourth time to close the deal. I was going to leave here and go preach to people in four states. I had my arm up in the air. Then something happened to me that Sunday morning that has never happened before or after in 56 years of preaching. I'd had dinner with that committee the night before. I woke up the next morning sicker than I'd ever been in my life. I mean, it was supernaturally sick. I got up in that pulpit over on 18th and Dutton and preached seven minutes and croaked. I couldn't say another word. The committee walked out that door and looked at me as if they'd seen a ghost. I never heard from them again. Best thing ever happened to me. Now, you may not attribute that thing to the ram in the bush, but I do. Never happened before, never happened after. I was not ready to go to that church. The next three pastors virtually had their ministries crushed by difficulties in that church. I would have never finished the degree, and I would have never found the ram in the thicket. It was the church God wanted me to go to that had the rest of my destiny in it. But all I knew was I sure was sick that morning. God can and will sometimes say stop. And when he closes the door, it's best that you not try to put WD-40 on it. <laughs> I've got to stop. It's hard to stop this without seeing some foreshadowing, some hazy, nebulous, something more that Abraham knew. Jesus said it. He said he rejoiced yeah, to see my day. I don't know what that means. But I do know this, that because of that, you and I can stand at another hill and say back to God what God said to Abraham. since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God said that to Abraham, but in some faint way, perhaps he understood that someday what God said to him, we could say back to God, I know you love me because you've not withheld your son your only son, from me. Here I am. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, please take these ancient words and again, give them new light for my life and for the lives of those here and beyond here. May we learn afresh to hand you that blank check, trusting that whatever hard questions it raises, you can both stop us and do something better for us. Please fasten our minds to that today, and may the seed of the word stay and bring forth a harvest. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand as we continue to sing? And I am yours no longer my own put me to whatever you will and place me with whomever you choose for I am yours and
seeing Zach in the sanctuary for our benediction. So together, let's sing the doxology together and we can go. Praise God from whom 